It is Wednesday again. This is the Wednesday Weekly Learning Session for Local Bar Community School. My name is Carlos Navia. I do this every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Pacific Time, 6 p.m. Eastern Time. You're always welcome to be a part of this class by following Local Bar Community School on Facebook. If you're already an enrolled student, when the drop down menu comes up, you can pick that you're an enrolled student. You will go directly to the link to the Zoom call. Um, if you're not a student, they're going to ask you for a little information. And then you'll be given the link to the Zoom call and you are welcome to ask me any questions about anything. I have been a bartender for a couple of decades in a handful of states and two different countries. I have been training bartenders for local bartending school for about eight years now. Um, continue to do it from Florida to California, where I live here on the Central Coast in San Luis Obispo, where I'm coming to you from my backyard tiki bar setup here that I have, Trey Bartenders Lit. So, um, don't think there's any questions about anything right now. So, um, just talk a little bit about kind of what's going on. Um, I live in California. I'm originally from the Los Angeles area, and we lost Vin Scully last night, who was the voice of the Los Angeles Dodgers and Brooklyn Dodgers baseball team for 67 years. Great announcer, great person. So everybody's kind of sad and talking about that today. Um, very cool guy. Um, you know, if you're from Southern California, it's, you know, the voice, you just grew up listening to it on the radio. So sorry for the passing of Vin Scully. I'll throw his picture on real quick. A picture of him. So we lost Vin Scully, our announcer for 67 years for the Dodgers. Um, sad, sad day here in California where I live. But I digress, and we'll kind of move on to talking about bars. I'll talk about that too much. So I wanted to get into a little bit today just about talking a little bit about the equipment we're going to use in the bar and the stuff that we're going to see, and a little bit just about pouring exercise and practicing and getting used to that perfect pour so you know how much you're putting into each drink. So if we just start off with kind of our simple stuff, we've got our mixing tins like this. A little small one here locks in nicely there like that for shaking drinks. And also do it with a pint glass. And once again, this is just a pint glass from Dollar Tree. Um, you don't have to spend a lot of money to, you know, find some glassware. Dollar Tree or local thrift store is really, really good for finding stuff to practice with or stuff, you know, kind of building and making up your home bar. So we have that stuff here. Um, this is a very cool shot glass that I know local bartending school sends out with some lines on it that measures it, a measuring shot glass. Really cool for when you're practicing and, you know, trying to test yourself to see how close you're getting to the mark. Also, we've got our jiggers here. And it's important to kind of know what you're working with. You can see I've got two different sized ones here. Um, you know, at my local restaurant supply store here where I live in San Luis Obispo, when I went in to buy this one, I believe there are six different sizes that they sold. So it's important to know the size you're dealing with. And they should have, and I say should because not all of them are, are made that way, but they should have either on the outside or just on the inside lip, some little numbers printed or etched into the side. This one's a one and a quarter on one side, a three quarters on one side. This one's a one and a half ounce on one side and a one ounce on the other side. Um, if you get one that's in metric, 30 milliliters is an ounce. So 15 milliliters, a half ounce, 30 milliliters an ounce. And, you know, you kind of go up from there. And that's the proper equivalent of it. If you do have one that's got metric measurements on it. But just important to know the size we're working with so that we practice and we talk about the pouring exercises. We know that we're hitting the right amount. We're hitting the right mark that we're looking for. Um, go to my handy dandy bar spoon here. And this one's got this nice little red nub on the side here because that's actually the end that's intended to go in and stir drinks not really supposed to stir drinks with the spoon side because it makes a scratching sound and people will say that they taste metal in their drinks now do they really no because you can't scratch metal off just with a spoon you probably have to go get some uh, tools out of the garage to actually scratch metal off with the inside of one of these so that's just what they're there for it makes a better sound i also you know I like to stir drinks in a uh, pint glass like this a lot of times, too, so that people can see their drink as I'm stirring it. And, you know, this doesn't make a sound, whereas the planking in there kind of makes a sound not as good. Also, when you talk about something like a French 75 that, you know, I talk about the Mondanium where I live here a lot. They make a version of it with pink champagne because it's pink and everything there is pink. Um, but they do it right in the glass with sugar, lemon juice, and the gin. And then they get down in there and they stir it all up. And I can get this down into the bottom of my champagne flute a lot easier than I can get this spoon down there to mix up that sugar and get it stirred up. So that's what it's there for. And that's why we have it. Now, that being said, I watch a lot of videos. Uh, I really like a TV show called Bar Rescue with John Taffer that I watch a lot. And about half the trainers on his show 
use this in and half the trainers on his show use the spoon if you want to use the spoon in it's fine it's still going to stir a drink there's no big deal about it adam fortier who won world-class best bartender in the united states last year uses the spoon in to stir drinks so if you want to feel free to i just like to explain why that is there Ooh, as i drop it and it does kind of you know bring up the question what is the spoon intended for there? why is it there two reasons you can use it for measurements a lot of times i'll take a bar spoon of sugar for something that's about the same amount as a bar about the same amount as a sugar cube which is about the same amount as one restaurant packet of sugar that's about the right amount for one drink. So a bar spoon of sugar. Also, it's used for making layered shots. Different liquors have different densities, you know, and one will sit on top of the other. This is just colored water out here, so it really won't work. But, you know, if you put some Kahlua into a shot glass and then gently pour Baileys over the back of your spoon, the Baileys would sit on top of the Kahlua. You could come back then, pour Grand Meunier over it. The Grand Meunier would sit on top of the Baileys, and you would have three different layers of color for layered shots. So that is what the spoon is there for. That is what we have it for. This off to the side. Now we got a muddle or a bat, you know, different things like these. And in general, you know, you don't really have to grind the stuff up into little pieces necessarily, especially if it's something that you're leaving in the drink. You know, I've got some mint here from my garden. We're making something like a mojito. We're really not trying to grind up the pieces of the leaf. All we're trying to do is break up pockets of oil that are in the leaf itself. That is the essence of the mint. That's what we're trying to get out of it. Grinding up the little pieces doesn't do anything. So all you really have to do is mash it. You know, if I'm making a mojito, I'm getting the juice out of the limes and I'm just breaking up those pockets of oil in the leaf of the, um, of the mint there. And you can also do this move, not my favorite move. And because of COVID, try not to handle people's garnishes you know, as little as possible, but just see people put it in their hands and do the clapping motion there. And that's the same thing. They're just breaking up those pockets of oil. If you take a piece of mint, put it in your hand, clap, smell it first, put it in your hand, clap, smell it again. You'll really smell the difference of those oils coming out. That's the essence of that mint. And when we do a little straight demonstration uh, here in a minute, we'll kind of talk more about that. And that's why I've got my mint out here. And, you know, kind of that being said as well, um, watch a lot of videos, see a lot of people grind, and grind and grind, you know, their stuff up into pieces. Um, a couple of reasons, you know, number one is they're putting on a show. And they're putting some effort into it because they're making a video. Second of all, when we go and slap on our screen here, it's got a little nub that steps up there. And it's just for your first finger to hold it into place with a little bit of pressure so it doesn't pop out. When they go to strain that out, if they've ground it up into little pieces, they're putting it through a double strainer. So you might see this. It's a really big trend right now, especially when we talk about handcrafted cocktails, which is still a big trend going on, to do the double strain. So none of the stuff I have crushed up in here, none of the seeds, none of the peels, none of anything like that is going to end up in the final drink. It's all going to be strained out through a double strainer there like that and not going to be part of it. So if you are doing double strain stuff like that, go to town. Have a good time. Grind it up. Let the people see you're putting some effort into it. But if you're not doing that, all you really have to do is mash the stuff up, get the juice out of the fruit, you know, get the essence out of the mint or the herbs that you're using for that particular drink. Move this to the side. Um, we got an ice scooper. It's pretty easy. It's going to go here in my ice. It scoops ice. Um, tongs, once again, for picking up fruit. Uh, you know, there's different policies in different states. Where I live in California um, now, actually, technically, you have to be wearing a glove or use tongs to touch fruit. So you may see these around depending on, you know, where you live and the regulations um, in that area. And if you end up seeing one of these little things that flips over like this, I had to look it up myself and see what this is designed for because I think it's kind of funny. Um, this is designed for me to pick up a wedge of fruit put it in there with my tongs and squeeze it. And it's got a little pour spout there so that I can squeeze it out into a drink without actually ever touching the fruit with my fingers or with my hands. So that is what that is there for if you ever see that. Of course, we had our juice squeezer, handcrafted cocktails, you know, still continues to be a big trend and I'm sweating. So I'm gonna wipe this out my eyes real quick. Uh, it is nice and warm here in Central California. It's only about 85. It's not that bad. I grew up where it's 115 right now. Um, you know, we're going to cut our fruit in half, uh, push it through there, mash it through. 
And we'll talk a little bit more about taking the nubs off the fruit to get a good squeeze for using something like this. But, you know, handcrafted simply means we're not using pre-made mixes. So we're squeezing fresh juices. We're doing everything fresh by hand right there for the person that's enjoying the cocktail. Might see a vegetable peeler like this, especially in those handcrafted places. Taking a nice good peel off the side to make a lemon twist is um, kind of a trend now. And you see that a lot, too. So you might see a vegetable peel or something like this as well. I think we got everything out there. Jiggers. I got a couple of pictures of some things I just don't have out here in my tiki bar. Fruit tray like this guy here. Got the little white containers you put the fruit in. It's important when you're filling it up, you know, we start with a fresh white container. We'll put the fresh fruit in there. The fruit from the day before is still good. We put it on top. We use it first. If it is questionable, there is no question. Throw it away. Start with fresh stuff. There's nothing worse than getting a brown lime on a drink. It just doesn't even make you want to drink the drink at all. Start with fresh fruit. doesn't cost that much money. Also, and this picture is a bad example because it's just a picture online. When you're filling up the olives and the cherries, make sure you put some juice in there. Um, you know, you leave them in that juice. It keeps them from drying out. Also, if I'm going to make a dirty martini, I've got some olive juice right there. I can just pick up the container, pour it into my mixing tin, boom, and I'll put my olive juice to make my dirty martini. Also, please clean the entire thing out. I've seen too many bartenders that will always start with a fresh white tray and, you know, change it out properly, but never clean the entire housing and it gets dirty and stuff spills down in there. Please remember it is housing stuff we're giving to people to eat. So keep it clean. It should be clean enough to eat off of because that's what we're doing. We're storing food in it. Other thing you might see is a salt ring looks like this. Got a whole thing collapses, opens up. It's got a sponge on top where it says lime juice. What we use is Rose's lime juice, which is a sweetened lime syrup that we have in the bar. Usually grenadine, Rose's lime juice, two things you're going to have in your bar that are not alcoholic in your well right there. Salt in the top, sugar in the bottom. Although I've seen places put other things in the bottom, stuff like celery salt that they would use to uh, put on the rims of their Bloody Marys. They would just serve that way. Um, since we're putting a sugar syrup on that sponge, the thing really does need to be cleaned out every day if you're using it. You can't just fold it up and leave it there, especially not for extended periods. I will not name the place, but I walked in for the first day of work at one place. I had the bar manager with me and the assistant uh, general manager of the entire hotel resort um, right there. I saw theirs. I could tell that it hadn't been cleaned in a very long time. And I said, that's disgusting. It looks disgusting. And they said, why? And I picked up the sponge and underneath the sponge was hundreds of dead fruit flies because they love that shit. And basically they've been rubbing people's glasses with dead fruit flies. Um, I think the bar manager threw up a little in his mouth. Um, the assistant general manager seemed very happy to have me there to point out stuff like that. And what I ended up doing at that place was I wouldn't set it up until someone ordered a margarita or something that I had to put a sugar or salt rim on. And that ended up being once a week, maybe twice a week. Other days of the week, I would just leave it because if I'm going to use it, I'm going to wash it every day. So if I'm not going to use it every day, I wouldn't set it up every day. In a situation like the beach in Florida where I worked, I'm setting it up every day. I'm using it every day. I'm cleaning it every day. I want it nice. I'm going to use it a lot. I don't want it to get it's disgusting and nasty. I don't want it to have fruit flies in it. So that's just a little overview of the type of equipment we're going to see and the type of equipment we're going to use in the bar. Get a little soda. Oh, wait, almost forgetting two things, too. I forgot two things. Two things a bartender must bring with them and have with them at all times. All of this equipment is going to be stuff that the bar will have. It's not something you're taking to work every day. Something you need to have on you. Um, number one, bottle opener. These are very popular. People really love these. I don't care for them particularly just because they would fall sideways in my pocket, can get it out of my pocket. It looks like I'm over here scratching my butt. Um, that's it. It just, it's not easy for me to get it in and out of my pocket. Only reason I don't like it. Um, this is kind of the newer version of them. And these are very cool, a little sleeker. I'm not sure what it's all meant to do with this little stuff here. I think this is designed for taking bottle caps off or something like that. Um, but the best part about these ones is that it doesn't matter which side you hit it with. It's going to grab it either way. They're really functional. They're really good. But they don't slip. Because I've tried a lot of different ones over the years, what I found out is you've got to have one that's good and it's not going to slip. So what happens if you slip, 
your knuckles will catch on that beer bottle cap, you'll cut your knuckles. And then you have to wear one glove and people call you Michael Jackson. And I'm dating myself with that reference, with that joke. So have one that's functional is the biggest thing that it functions, that it does well. Second thing is it fits somewhere on your person comfortably where you can get to it easily, get it out. Because here's the deal. The fastest money I can make in the bar, open a bottle of beer, hand it to someone, and they tip me a dollar for that. That's it. That's how fast I can do it. I can open two beers and take the person's money before I can get a cold pint glass out of a fridge to start pouring a draft beer. So have something that's functional, be able to get to it easily. I've seen many, you know, lady bartenders have a, you know, a wristband that holds it here. They can grab two bottles, bam, bam, right back into the, you know, their armband. Seen plenty of people keep it in their belt, grab it, boom, boom, right back into their belt where they get at it easily. I even saw one guy who had like a belt clip with a retractable keychain on it. So it just hung there and he could grab it, open two beers, drop it out of his hand and zoop, back to his belt, which I thought was interesting. I've seen tons of great, great bartenders just do this one right here. They just leave it right there on the bar or set it on their cash register somewhere there where they can get to it easily. They don't have to worry about getting it out of their pocket or anything. They grab two beers, they open them up, they set it back there. It's just that easy. So have a good one, have a functional one, make sure you can get to it easy and use it fast because that is the easiest, fastest, quickest money that you can make behind the bar is opening up beer bottles and getting tip for that. Second thing, where to go? Wine keyed open wine bottles. You know, two things you want to look for that are important. Um, and this one's kind of worn. It's seen some action in its day. Uh, coated screw, or what they refer to as the worm. The black coating on this screw is not for aesthetics. It's not for looks. It is specially designed to help it slide easier into a wine cork and less chance of tearing it up. So you don't want one with a chrome screw. It's harder to get into the cork. Make sure you get one with a coated screw. It's going to be a lot easier. You're not going to tear corks up. Second thing is this little piece right here, which is a double hinge. What this does is it allows you to reset on the bottle. Basically, I can take the bottle. I can take the cork halfway out, slip the second part in, reset it, and then get fresh leverage so that I'm not pulling the cork out with force. We don't want to pull the cork out with force. We don't want to make a popping sign, sound when you pull corks out for two reasons. Uh, number one, it's a sign of a bad bottle. Something like a bottle of Chardonnay or Merlot should not have pressure behind the cork. It's not carbonated. If bacteria gets into that bottle, um, upsets the fermentation process, it could cause it to have pressure to have carbonation. So there'd be pressure behind the cork. It would make a popping sound, sign of a bad bottle. Secondly, red wines, when they're exposed to air, uh, change flavor. It allows the wine to breathe, especially if it's been in a bottle 5, 10, 15 years. Exposing it to the air, letting it breathe for an hour is going to make a big difference. If I pull the wine cork out with force, pop, what happens is air shoots back into the bottle rapidly. And they will say it affects the flavor of the whole bottle. They refer to it as bruising the wine or bruising the bottle. So you don't want to pull it out with force. You should be able to pull it out nice and gently, not make a popping sound. And that double hinge really comes in handy for that. So that's talking about equipment. Almost forgot two things right there. I'm going to grab some club soda so I don't get too scratchy. And the other thing that I want to talk about that I kind of mentioned, you know, is just the pouring exercises that we practice. And what we practice is trying to time ourselves um, with the pour spout to get to where a four count is an exact ounce. So, you know, we all count at a different rate. So what we're doing is we're training ourselves to time up with the pour spout that we're using. We do a four count for an ounce. That's what we're trying to look for. I've got my jigger here with my one ounce side. Um, we want to time a four count with an ounce because it makes it easy to break it up. If I know that my four count is exactly one ounce, my one count's a quarter, my two's a half, my three's three quarters, all the way up to our six count, our ounce and a half standard pour, what most people, you know, put most drinks for a standard pour. So we want to work on that, timing ourselves with the pour spout to where our four count is that exact one ounce. Truth is, you know, we don't want to overpour, costing our boss money. It's not our liquor we're giving away. We don't want to underpour. It is a legitimate business. We're not trying to rob people. We want to give them what they paid for. And the truth is that it, it's kind of a... When trains come and by, I hope that's not too loud. Um, it is kind of a misconception that people like people always want a strong drink. And that's not true. The truth is that most people don't want a strong drink. Most people want a well-balanced drink. And that's the key. 
when you talk about recipes that have three, four, five different liquors in them, if you're not putting the right amount of each one in, you're not going to get the right balance of flavors. You don't end up with the right end result in the cocktail. So it is important to know how much you're pouring and how much you're putting into each drink. So, you know, I was taught to, to hold the bottle in kind of a specific way. With your first finger on the pour spout, you kind of guide it with that first finger, same way you do a pencil or chopsticks or something like that. That being said, not every bottle, you know, has a neck you can grab like that. For instance, if I go for my Crown Royal bottle, I can't hold it like that in any fashion. You just got to grab it by the booty, you know, and pour with it and be comfortable. So it is more about being comfortable, hitting the right mark, and it is really holding the bottle in any specific way. But the important thing when you're going to pour is that I don't want to come from the side. I don't want to be timid. I don't want to go halfway. You want to turn the bottle all the way over and make sure that the butt of the bottle is going up into the air all the way. Uh, they say it's opening the pour spout completely. It has to do with the airflow ratio. I am not a scientist. Please don't ask me to break it down, try to explain it. But when it is tipped over completely, you're getting the maximum flow through the pour spout. So it's open completely. You do want to turn it over completely. So I'm going to flip it over completely. I've got my one outside. I'm going to do my four count. And then when I'm done, I'm going to snap it back down completely as well. So one, two, three, four, and snap it back down. Now, I splashed a lot over there, a lot more than I intended to, <laughs> actually, uh, which is why mine's a little low. Um, but, you know. All bartenders are going to spill a little and splash a little, and that's why we have these mats. If no one ever spilled, there'd be no need for these. Whoever makes these, their families would starve because we wouldn't need them anymore. And the truth is, when you're pouring into the jigger like I, I was, just like that, you know, it's going to be a little different than when you're actually pouring into a glass. So we're working on it just to train. So spills a little, splash a little out like I did. Hey, that's fine. It's going to happen. See if I can try it again without splashing so much. One, two, three, four. Snap it back down. And I think my table's off level. <laughs> I'm hoping that is the problem. But work on getting that countdown to where it's an exact. Sorry, it's splashing over the top. To where it's an exact ounce. I'm just going to top that one off a little. And I can tell my table is really on level. And it's kind of throwing me off. But that's okay. We'll work through it. <laughs> so... We'll work on getting that into the jigger, going into the jigger, or you can use the shot glass as well, like that, which is more as well. Second thing to work on, or the second drill, I should say, pour it into the glass, see what it looks like. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a bar glass like this. It can just be a measuring glass, anything you have that's clear in your house that you can use. See what it is into there. And then work on pouring straight into the glass itself. One, two, three, four. And make sure you're coming back every time, checking yourself, seeing how close you are. And I'm right on the money. I'm right there. It's going to dribble over the front because of my table. <laughs> right there. Um, right there on an ounce. So work on that back and forth into the glass, into the jigger, back and forth. Or once again, you can use your, you know, your little shot glass like this, right on the mark there too, right on the line in that one to check it and see how close you're getting to the mark you're looking for. Next drill to do, I'll use that one as well. Next drill to do is just work on going glass to glass. Um, you know, bartending is a lot about efficiency, cutting down your motions, um, you know, cutting down your movements. You know, the more efficient I am, the more drinks I can make, um, more money I can make. So practice with both hands. That's always a big one. Make drinks with both hands, make twice as many drinks, make twice as much money. That's all there is to it. And work on going glass to glass. If I got three, you know, three drinks all have the same liquor. I'm touching that bottle one time. I'm hitting them all in one shot. Easy little flip of the wrist just from glass to glass. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, snap it back. But always come back and check yourself and see how close you're getting. And I'm right on the mark there, right on the little line of the shot glass. So go back and forth, um, you know, do the glass to glass. Practice, practice, practice. It is like riding a bicycle um, to where once you've done it a thousand times, you'll never forget. I would also like to say I have been poor tested in a job interview. They make a little thing that looks um, looks kind of like test tubes. They have different lines on them. You got to hit the test tube and hit the lines. 
Um, I didn't get the job. I did very well. I didn't get the job, but that happens. Not, not that big a deal. But, you know, just know that ad is important. People are aware of that, especially when you walk in a new place to look for a job or a first day on a job. They're, they're going to be checking to see how much you're pouring because it is important. So glass to glass. The other one, and like I was just talking about, you know, we, we got to work with both hands. You got to be end predictors. You got to work with both hands at the same time. So if I've got, say, three margaritas, and I'm going to put an ounce and a half of tequila. Let's say this is my tequila, but I'm only going to do a half ounce of triple sec in each one. I can still hit them in one shot down the line by simply pulling this one off after the two count. So I only get half an ounce. So I go one, two. Yeah, nice. I'm going to reset that. I screwed myself up my own timing count. So I'm going to do an ounce and a half of this one, half an ounce of this one. I'm going to pull this one off after the two. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And I should have exactly two ounces in each one of these. You know, I kind of check it here in my one ounce jigger. Should be pretty close right on by. So practice both hands, practice back and forth from glass to glass, getting comfortable, moving the stuff from glass to glass and doing that. Um, the other thing is try different amounts. You know, I could have three drinks that all have vodka in them, but have a different amount of vodka in them. I'm still grabbing my vodka bottle one time. I'm hitting them in one shot. One, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six. I know it's kind of cheesy, but count out loud. It really will help you. Um, can be weird. I know when you're in a room alone, counting out loud yourself, I've been there, but you'll be able to hit the marks just like I can, you know, with it on here. Once you practice, get that timing down and know your, oh, that's my house now. and know your poor spout and, you know, know how fast you're going. So work on those all the way across, going across. The other thing I'll talk about is if you happen to get a job where they asked you to pour with a jigger, it's not too hard. And I've seen a couple of places where you can make excellent money um, using a jigger to pour every time. There's a place, I'm sure it's still around this day. I haven't been in New Orleans, Louisiana in a very long time, but there used to be, and probably still this day, a place in the French Quarter on Bourbon Street called Cat's Meow. I've been there many times. And even though the party's in one direction, I'm generally looking at what's going on behind the bar and watching. So I saw this happen and it's very crazy what they do before every shift. A manager comes through the bar and weighs all the bottles on digital scales and writes it down. After each shift, manager comes back through the bar, weighs all the bottles on digital scales and writes it down. They don't, you know, they know where every drop of liquor goes in that place. And their bartenders do it very easily, do their one and a half ounces to the top, pour it in. One and a half ounces to the top, pour it in, not too long. But there's a second place. And when I went to bartending school, many, 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 many years ago, they showed us a VHS tape. It's a, I won't go into what a VHS tape was. Um, showed us a VHS tape of a place where I grew up down in Palm Desert, California, called the Desert Springs Marriott. Uh, understand that this is not your average hotel in the sense that it has a mall in it. It has a nightclub in it. Um, it has several different restaurants, it has a giant pool deck because it's super hot out there with a pool bar. Um, it has a river that comes into the lobby and you board a little boat in the lobby and it takes you on a one hour cruise of the property. And why would it take an hour to cruise around to Marriott, you ask? Good question. Because it has two 18 hole golf courses on it. It's a giant property. It's an entire city block. Um, what's this suite's not good enough for you? That's fine. Check in at the front desk and we'll get you a villa. That's a two bathroom, three bedroom house on the golf course. Did you check in to the front desk of the Marriott and they give you some keys and they give you a little golf cart and your bags will be out there in a little while and you drive out to the little house and just like you live in a golf cart for every long you stay at the Marriott. Um, when they got the job there, bartenders issued a jigger looks just like this one. In a little velvet bag that says Desert Springs Marriott. It was part of their uniform. They were required to have it on them at all times, no matter what bar they were assigned to. But they did a little trick, and I love this little trick, and I think it's great. They would do an ounce and a half pour. However, they use the one outside, and they do a little trick like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. 
And because I'm turning it over after the four count, it looks like I'm giving the person extra, but I'll use this glass. But if I go to my measuring glass here and go up to one and a half ounces, I'm right on the dot. It's exactly an ounce and a half what they were. It's a cool trick. You know, your boss would have to be okay with you doing it, knowing that you're not really over pouring everybody, that you are giving them the right amount that they paid for. This is something that was intentionally done on this property simply because it's a very expensive property. They wanted to be people to feel like they're being cooked up. You know, they wanted everybody to walk out of that place and think, man, I love coming here. All the bartenders hook me up. They all take care of me and give me extra. So it's just something they did intentionally and would have to be something that your boss is okay with you doing before, you know, try doing anything that at that like that at work, uh, you know, in the bar you work at. <clears throat> so that was the subject what I wanted to talk about today. And we've still got some time. So got some ideas, just a couple of summer um, ideas, you know, kind of in the dog days, not much is happening. Still got a couple weeks of summer before kids go back to school. And then we've still got Labor Day weekend coming up, which is kind of the end of summer. Although, because goes kids go back to school earlier, it's kind of fallen off as, as a holiday, especially in the beach places. So I've got some stuff out here. And um, let's, uh, let's give something to try here and have a little fun. So I've got some mint out here. And I was talking, you know, about the mint and, and mashing it up and, uh, you know, doing muddled cocktails. <coughs> Excuse me. So grab my handy dandy mixing tin here and I've got a cutting board. I'm going to move some stuff over here, cutting board and my knife. And I've got some fresh strawberries from out here in California where I live. Nice. That'll be perfect for a strawberry mojito with some of the mint here for my garden as well. So I'm just going to take the tops off these, cut these guys in half. Get that in there, like that. And then, of course, for a mojito, we're going to need some mint. So I'm going to pick off some of these mint leaves. Here, like that, into my tin as well. Let me grab just a couple more. Perfect. Then, of course, we're going to need some lime. So I've got half a lime here. I'm just going to cut up into four pieces and throw it in there as well. And I'm going to put in some simple syrup as well. Give it some sweetness. Just like that. So I've got my sugar. I've got my strawberry. Got my limes. I've got my mint. I'm ready to go. And I am going to give this one a double strain because it's going to have those, you know, strawberry seeds and stuff in there and maybe some pulp that I don't necessarily want to get into my finished product cocktail here. So give it a good mash, make sure everything's good and nice and mixed up in there. Go on to nice. And once again, this is just colored water because I don't want to waste any alcohol out here. We'll do an ounce and a half of our clear rum, our white rum, into there. And give this a nice pop on there. Give it a good shake. Get that nice and mixed up. Perfect. And we're going to get a glass with some fresh ice here. And once again, we're going to grab a double strainer. We're going to give it a nice double strain. Take out any of that, you know, um, bit of the strawberry um, seeds, anything like that that you might have there in the drink. Some of that through. Please don't take the mixing tin and jam it down in there. Your hands have been over that. So it's not sanitary. You can kind of knock it through there. Oh, I've got some more in there to drip out. If you really, really, really just feel like you have to mash it in there and mash it all the way through, let's throw that out there. Please grab the bat, grab the muddle, use it to mash it all the way through there. And I can just simply knock it through a good bottle. Without putting the button into there, getting that in anybody's drink. Get it all nice and knock through there. So I'm just around a little bit of pulp and stuff that I have there on the bottom. Just like that. 
Let this dirt clean up. All right. And then we just need some club soda to top it off with. And of course, we'll need a little uh, strawberry here to garnish it on the side. Set that guy just like there. Of course, we'll need a little mint sprig too, since it's a mojito. Get a nice little mint sprig just like this. Give a little smack there once again, just to kind of break up those pockets of oil there in the mint. Stick it in there nicely like that. We have our strawberry mojito, great, great summer cocktail, light, refreshing, very, very nice, good for the summer, great evening. So let's see what else I have here. Okay, I like this one, so I wanted to give this one a try. I'm gonna grab a glass here. I'm gonna do here, this, I saw this online and I kind of liked it. A little bit of a take on a margarita, but not done traditionally. I'm going to bring this out to give me a salt rim. Grab a little salt here. So I've got some ice here in my mixing tin. You know, a mess. Sure, I have something that looks like tequila. Yes, so we're going to do an ounce and a half here of our tequila. Then our orange liqueur. So we're still doing just kind of like a margarita, the same way we're going to start. Just a half ounce. Do a half ounce one there. Then we're going to do some fresh lime juice. Actually, cut this lime up here. I'm going to take these little nubs off the little end off the lime here. And when we put it in the squeezer, we'll kind of see how it makes a difference when you go to squeeze it. So if you leave the little nubs on there on the top, Sometimes this round part will come down, catch the nub, pull, fold the piece of fruit in half. When you cut them off, you get a nice flat surface for this to come down on. It'll be a nice, good squeeze of your fruit in there. And once again, half a lemon, half a lime. It's about half an ounce. So we're going to put a half an ounce of fresh lime juice in there. This one's called a pink senorita. It's our little take on a margarita. And we're going to go ahead and top it off to make it pink with some pink lemonade. I'm going to put a little bit of pink lemonade in there. So we'll grab our handy dandy mixer in there. Give it a nice good shape with that mixed up. I'm gonna take this piece of lime and give myself a nice salted rim here on my glass. Here in a plate or on some Tupperware if you don't you know have a salt ring or that stuff laying around your house as well. Throw some fresh ice. Here into our glass. A nice strain there. Nice pink color. Right there we go. There we go. And we've got our pink senorita. You have a nice line there on the side. A couple small straws. Nice little take on the margarita there. Perfect for summertime. Awesome pink color. Delicious, delicious cocktail. Got a little time. Let's do one. What else do I got here? Oh, yes. Definitely want to try this. So I like this one. Let me rinse my stuff out here real quick. I like this one, too. thought it looked cool. I thought it looked summery. thought it had a good, uh, good kind of summer color vibe to it. I don't know anything with blue curacao, I think, seems to make me, uh, seems to make me like it. Um, I think it's fun. Some gravel, once again, a handy dandy mixing tin. Throw a little bit of ice in there, not too far, just about two thirds of the way up. So I make sure I've got room for my ingredients and stuff in there. And this time we're going to do, once again, rum. So we're doing an ounce and a half of white rum of any kind. Bacardi or Captain makes a white rum now as well. A um, bunch of different folks do as well. And we're going to do in this one a half ounce of fresh lemon juice. So I'm going to take my sticker off. I don't need a sticker in anyone's drink. I'm going to take my nubs off the end so I get a nice good squeeze. Cut this in half. I'll make a nice lemon wheel as well here. Nice garnish for it. Go into my squeezer. Wow, that's a big lemon. Got a good squeezer. Come on, lemon. Grab too big a lemon. 
going to make it work. There we go. Got it in there. You can kind of see when you got that nub on it, sometimes on the bigger fruit piece, you don't get that good squeeze or I'm going to get a good, nice flat squeeze in there. My half ounce of fresh lemon juice. Eh. And then we're going to top it off with some lemonade. I'm just going to do about two ounces of lemonade here. Just a half, just a little more. There we go. So we've got our rum, our lemon juice, our lemonade. We'll go ahead, lock it in. Give this a nice chill. Do the underhand. Give it a nice shake like this. Put that nice and chilled out. It'll dilute it a little bit. And of course, I mentioned that we're going to do something blue. Going to have some blue curacao involved. I want to do this guy. So I'm just going to go ahead and put some glue at the bottom. And once again, this is just water. We've got the blue curacao, real blue curacao. It's going to be thicker. So it'll go down there and sit at the bottom. Then I can take my, and this is called mermaid lemonade. So I then can take my lemonade and fill it up and get that nice blue effect there from the bottom coming up to the top of the glass. As you pour it down in there through. And of course, we'll give it a nice cheer lemon wheel on the side. Make it look pretty. We'll give it a straw. We could also throw a cherry in there with that guy as well. And that's it. We've got our mermaid lemonade, nice, cool, refreshing blue lemonade drink, perfect for summertime. Full peak. Pool, beach, lake, river, wherever you're hanging out by the water. Awesome, awesome drink. I still got a limit, a little time, so I've got some stuff out here. We'll do throw one more at you. Um, this is kind of just a traditional take on a traditional drink. You know, again, looks really easy. Sugar and lime juice. Uh, you know, those are basic in ingredients that are going into it. Um, traditionally done with gin, but it can be done with vodka now. People do them with vodka as well. This stuff, quick rinse. And it still just remains, you know, one of the top 10, you know, most popular drinks in the world to this day. So don't have this glass chilled already. Going to go ahead and throw some ice in here and let this glass chill while I'm building the cocktail. Set it off to the side. So do what we're going to do, though, is we're going to do a little different here. Going to cut up half a lime. So I get some fresh lime juice in there for our gimlet. Also going to do some simple syrup. We're going to do an ounce of that in there as well. My simple syrup will come out. There we go. Now like that. And then I got some strawberries out here. So let's throw some strawberries in there as well. And uh, it'll work. And then we'll take that, take the green off here, cut these in half. Put them in there. So I've got some strawberry, and to give it a little twist here from the garden, we're going to throw in some rosemary. And we're going to mash that up in there as well. So we've got a strawberry, rosemary, gimlet that we're going to do here with our sugar and our fruit and our limes and our simple syrup and our herbs. And I'm going to double strain this one as well. So I'm going to give it a nice good mashup. Get those herbs and stuff mashed up in there. Very, very nice. There we go. That looks good. And once again, going to give this one a double strain. So I'm going to get my ice. Throw it into my mixing tin. And then we're going to do two ounces of would be gin. And you know, different gins are going to have different flavors. And Doggo, this is a strawberry gin made by Stoop Dog, would be perfect for you know a cocktail like this. And we can just give it a nice stir. I'm just going to get that moving around, get it in there, stir it up. All that stuff mixed up nicely. A little dilution, bring everything down to 32 degrees. 
Get that nice and mixed up in there. Rosemary trying to climb out. You got a nice, good mix. There we go. All right, I'll throw the ice out of my glass. It is nice and chilled now. Once again, we're going to give this the old double strain so that we're taking everything out of there. Nicely into our nice chilled stem cocktail martini glass. A little shake, a little more is going to come out every time, just like that. I can knock it through nicely. Just like that. And of course, we've got to have a strawberry to garnish this. So throw a little strawberry on the side there. A nice piece of, if I can get this to break. There we go. Nice piece of rosemary. Once again, I'm going to give a little smack on the side there to unlock the oils and the essence of the rosemary. Give it there. And we've got our strawberry and rosemary gimlet. Perfect summertime cocktail, mixing fresh stuff from the garden. So that is our show for today for Wednesday, August 3rd. Um, you know, please come join me next week. Next week, we're just going to talk about a little bit about just what the trends are here happening in 2022. You know, we're a little over halfway through the year. Kind of going to see, you know, what the cocktail trends have been so far this year and see what people are predicting as the future cocktail trends for, you know, fall, winter season coming up in 2022. So thank you very much for watching. Have a great week and we'll see you next Wednesday. Thank you.